Before I start reading, let me just mention. John Carter was born at Halifax in 1889. He was the editor of the Christadelphian magazine for 25 years, from 1937 through the war years to 1962 when he died. He was the author of a number of very useful books on scripture. In fact, he was, in my opinion, the best Christadelphian expositor since Brethren Thomas and Roberts. So, The Parables of the Messiah by Brother John Carter. And we will start with the preface. The word parable by derivation means placing one thing beside another from which has arisen the idea of comparison, although this idea is not essentially involved in the meaning of the word. Precise definition of the word is not easy, as may be seen by comparing the attempts that have been made to define it and by the differences of opinion whether certain sayings should be classified as parables or as some other figure of speech. The shorter Oxford Dictionary gives the following meaning. A comparison, a similitude, any saying or narration in which something is expressed in terms of something else, an allegory or epilogue also any kind of enigmatical or dark saying. From a particularly biblical point of view, Bengal's definition is good, but not quite adequate. A parable is a form of speech which, by means of a fictitious narration, which yet resembles the truth and is taken from matters belonging to the usages of ordinary life, represents truths which are less known or of a moral nature. In the following pages, eighty sayings and stories of Jesus have been considered. Some of these might be excluded by a too rigid definition of the word parable, but we think all are either proper parables or sayings containing the germ of a parable, and therefore capable of being expanded into one. As figures of speech used by Jesus, we think readers will approve their inclusion. The title, Parables of the Messiah, has been chosen not only because the parables were spoken by Jesus the Messiah, but because we believe that only by a messianic interpretation being given to many of them, do we reach the meaning Jesus intended. The parables were spoken by the king to people interested in the kingdom of God. They were a challenge to men to think. The figures Jesus used in his parables were generally connected with Old Testament language concerning the Messiah. Failure to discern which hinders recognition of what was in the thought of Jesus. In other words, the messianic content of the parables is the primary meaning, and to make them merely stories for moral truths robs them of their vital purpose. The reader will judge the truth of this comment as he reads the interpretations of the parables here set forth. The study of the parables pays a rich dividend in fuller understanding of Jesus Christ, as well as of his message. And since so many parables are rooted in the Old Testament, it increases the knowledge and understanding of the writings of Moses and the prophets. Many attempts at classification of the parables have been made, But no scheme can serve more than a very limited purpose. There are many parables which can be placed in one group or another according to the whim or object of the one who classifies them. To deal with the parables in the order in which we find them in the Gospels, beginning with Matthew, appeared the most practical way. This way has been followed, therefore. 
to facilitate comparison between the gospel records, a table of contents is supplied with the references in the gospels where a saying or parable is found. This will enable the reader to find easily all the scriptures concerning any parable dealt with. Since Jesus spoke in many places and would certainly repeat his words, some sayings are reported in one context in one gospel and in another context in another record. The inclusion, therefore, in the table of contents of more than one scripture reference does not necessarily mean that the references are to the same incident. This should be remembered as a different context may give a slightly changed accent to a saying, particularly if the saying has the form of a proverb ex expressed in general terms. A glance at this table of scripture references shows which sayings occurred in all the synoptists, which occurred in two of them, and which are peculiar to one gospel. There were doubtless reasons why each gospel writer included certain episodes in his record and omitted others. The enquiry into those reasons belongs to the study of the gospels as a whole. But so far as the parables are involved in the investigation, the table will help to supply the information. It will be noticed that there are no parables in the fourth gospel. The word parable occurs in the authorised version, John 10 verse 6, but it is more correctly translated proverb, see revised version. John's gospel records aspects of the life of the master that Matthew, Mark and Luke do not touch upon. The character of the discourses is different. The themes discussed are different. That does not mean that John's Gospel has no figurative language. On the contrary, figures occur on every page. But they're not in the form of parables, but are drawn from Old Testament types. Almost all the discourses in John's Gospel are expositions by the Lord of the foreshadowings in the law of his own work. A brief chapter has been added on this subject, but for fuller consideration of the fourth gospel, the reader is referred to the exposition of the gospel of John, which incidentally was also written by Brother John Carter. A scripture index of the parables and of other scriptures quoted or referred to is included at the end of the book, April 1947. Parables of the Messiah Chapter 1 Salt Matthew chapter 5 verse 13 Mark 9 verse 49 and 50 Luke 14 verses 34 and 35 in these passages we find that three times in his teaching Jesus refers to salt, and always in a figurative sense. While perhaps not strictly parables, they are close to related forms of speech. We take each in turn. 1. The first is in the Sermon on the Mount and follows immediately after the Beatitudes. Jesus had declared who are blessed, and all the Beatitudes until the last one are expressed objectively. Blessed are the poor. But in the last while he began, blessed are they, he at once applied it to the disciples. Blessed are ye, when men shall reproach you. This transition to the direct address leads on to saying, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out, 
and to be trodden underfoot of men. Matthew 5, verse 13. The blessed, his disciples, are the salt of the earth. The phrase has become a cliché, forbidden to humorists by the BBC, and spoken as hackneyed words, has taken on a different shade of meaning from when used by Jesus. Salt preserves and gives flavour to food. The fishermen among Christ's hearers knew how quickly their harvest of the sea corrupted, unless taken to the pickling vats of Bethsaida. All his listeners knew that in the warm atmosphere of their land, any dead thing quickly became tainted and perished. In what way, then, were the blessed like unto salt? The general view, the easy interpretation, is that the disciples of Jesus are the preserving element in society, preventing by their influence the spread of corruption. Some go so far as to say that as Sodom would have been saved for ten righteous men's sake, so the world is not destroyed because of the Christians in it. There is an element of truth in these ideas. For the elect's sake, God does direct the world for the development of his purpose, and the moral principles of Christ's teaching have in measure affected for good some things in society. But it remains that the world will be destroyed, and that because of the unchecked corruption in it. It would seem to be rather of the savour that Jesus is thinking, for he at once speaks of this being lost, while no mention is made of the preserving power. And men are salt, as they have the savour of salt, men as they are in themselves, and not as they influence their fellows. This is borne out when we remember that Jesus uses two figures in one breath. His disciples are salt, and they are the light of the world. The one saying describes their own quality, and the second their relationship to those about. His disciples, then, who show meekness, mercy, purity of heart, desire for righteousness, have the wholesomeness and the savour that God desires. They can lose this quality, as salt in Palestine does lose its saltiness, and is then fit for no useful purpose. Thompson in The Land and the Book tells of an importer trying to cheat, losing money by his salt, losing its saltiness. 2. Mark's reference brings in another association of salt with other ideas involved which Jesus must have had in mind in all his allusions to salt. Passing through Galilee, he foretold his death and resurrection but the apostles had other preoccupations which prevented them following his thought when he spoke of suffering and death. They were discussing which one of them should be the greater in the kingdom he was to establish. Their minds were so fixed on an immediate restoration of this kingdom that they could not think of Jesus dying. They were so concerned with their own preeminence that they had no sympathy for the leader whose mind was fixed on effacement of self and suffering and sacrifice. Jesus proceeded to tell them that the way to exaltation was by the abasement of self. If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Jesus took a child and pointed out the need for the childlikeness of disposition. He then said that it was better that a disciple should now sacrifice hand or foot or eye, if it be necessary, than by keeping them be cast at last into Gehenna and be completely destroyed. Then he gave the reason for this counsel. 
For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith shall ye season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. Chapter 9, verse 49 and 50. Here again the context is the guide. Jesus had put before them the amputation of desire now, or complete destruction, where their fire is not quenched, in the future. To escape the latter, everyone must now be salted with fire, and the verb salted recurs. Every sacrifice shall be salted with salt, and this second occurrence explains the first. It refers us to the law of the offerings. While leaven and honey were forbidden adjuncts of the meal offering, both being agents of fermentation, salt was essential. Every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Leviticus 2, verse 13. The salt with the meal offering was a token of covenant relationship. To partake of a meal together was a covenant of salt between men. It was a covenant ratified by a meal. So rigid was this rule that the story is told of a thief who partook of food in a tent, and when caught escaped punishment because the sheik regarded the act of partaking of food, even under those circumstances, as a covenant of salt. The salt with the offering spoke of the covenant by virtue of which the meal offering was acceptable. Remembering this, and that Leviticus 2 verse 13 is the source of the phrase used by Jesus, his meaning must be that as every offering must be made in the bonds of covenant, salted with salt, so the cutting off of the desires of sin were essential as a condition of offering, salted with fire. Fire is purifying. To be salted with fire is to be purified as the covenant requires, removing stumbling blocks even at the cost of limbs. Jesus makes the personal application to the situation before him when contentious men in self-esteem were seeking precedence over each other. He also uses the phrase on other occasions about salt losing its saltness. They were salt, as he had before told them, and in this context the greater fullness of his thought is seen. They had savour and wholesomeness as being in God's covenant. They could lose their saltiness by unworthy thought and rivalry, were in fact in danger of doing so then. In sharing the covenant sacrifice which he was making in subduing his will to the Father's will, they would resolve their disputes. When self is placed on the altar, contentions regarding precedence do not arise. Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another, he therefore counsels. In other words, keep in yourselves covenant principles as God's people. Make the needful sacrifice of self, and your contentions will pass, and you will have peace among yourselves. Paul has an echo of these sayings in Colossians 4, verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt, that you may know how ye ought to answer every man. The parallel in Ephesians 4, verse 29 is instructive and reads, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. 
A corrupt or putrid word is unwholesome and unfitted for the mouths of saints. It is not good, does not build up, nor minister grace. Speech seasoned with salt is clean, of good tang, of the quality that belongs to God's covenant, which Paul expresses in characteristic fashion as with grace and ministering grace, using a word which allows the play of graciousness with the deeper meaning of the relationship between God and man made possible by God's favour. Speech seasoned with salt is such as may be heard by God acceptably, speech free from the foul and the suggestive, which are so often conspicuous in the talk of men. 3. The saying in Luke's record forms part of an address to the multitudes crowding around Jesus, in which he warns them of the demands of discipleship. There came a time when men had to decide about him. They could not follow light-heartedly out of curiosity, or to see the sensational cures, or to share in his provisions for their need. Three times he uses the words, cannot be my disciple, chapter 14, verse 26, 27, and 33. The man who puts first home ties and the affections of the present and even his own life, the man unprepared to crucify his self, the man who cannot finish the task begun, renouncing all that he hath, none of these can be his disciples. Salt is therefore good. He continues, but if even the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be seasoned? To follow him was to take on the tang of salt that made them acceptable. But the savour must be retained, or it became unprofitable. So too would they, if they did not count the cost and in patient continuance, endure to the end. Wherewith shall it be salted? The emphasis is on the it. Degenerate salt cannot be salted, and how can people who have taken on the quality of salt losing it be acceptable? Neither is of use, as Jesus emphasizes. Salt in limited quantities was good for the land. It was mixed with the manure heap, but saltless salt could serve no purpose at all. Men threw it away.